Welcome back to the second episode of New Zealand's Unsolved Mysteries. Tonight we're going to talk about a topic which has terrified the nation and divided opinions everywhere. Cops, of course. Our world is filled with strange and baffling events. Across the centuries, countless occurrences have defied logical explanation. These events challenge the limits of our comprehension. They fascinate us. They disturb us. They force us to reconsider everything we thought we knew. Among these mysteries, crop circles stand out as one of the most perplexing. These intricate patterns often appearing overnight in fields have baffled scientists and enthusiasts alike. The history of crop circles dates back centuries with some of the earliest records appearing in the 17th century. These phenomena have been attributed to everything from natural forces to extraterrestrial beings. The significance of crop circles lies not just in their beauty, but in the mystery of their creation. Are they messages from beyond, or simply elaborate hoaxes? As we delve into the story of Natia, I invite you to join me on this journey into the unknown. If you're eager to explore more New Zealand mysteries, be sure to subscribe, hit that notification bell, and stay tuned for upcoming investigations into the unknown. On the 4th of September 1969 at 7.30pm, Wellington Air Traffic Control receives a chilling call. Two Straits Air Freighter Express pilots who had just taken off from Wellington heading to Blenheim reported an extraordinary sighting. Flying at an altitude of 3,000 feet, just above the suburb of Newlands, they noticed a fluorescent blue pulsating light. The light was below the plane, moving slowly at a speed of 50 or 60 knots, and was confirmed by Wellington Radar. The light isn't a star, nor is it another aircraft. It moves with an eerie fluidity, holding its position below and slightly ahead of us. We, our initial amusement quickly turning to concern, contact Wellington Air Traffic Control. As the plane passed over the Cook Strait, the light suddenly disappeared. The pilots provided detailed statements to Air Force authorities, but no explanation was ever found, and the matter was never discussed. Well, wasn't that bloody typical? Earlier that day, farmer Bert O'Neill was tending to his 20 hectare farm on Phillips Road, 23 kilometres south of Thames. He glanced over to a section on the farm which he had been neglecting at the southern boundary, covered in thick manuka. His once green manuka trees appeared to be silvery in colour. Thinking it was a bit odd, he decided to investigate. When he arrived at the trees, he couldn't quite believe what he had found. O'Neill walked through the healthy trees until he came to a section of the trees which were dead and had been bleached a silvery colour, forming a circular patch measuring 14.2 metres in circumference. The trees within the circle were withered or dead and completely devoid of any leaves, while the manuka on the outside of the circle were lush and green. Within the centre of the circle were three very clear, deep V-shaped impressions in the ground, measuring 90 centimetres long and 50 to 70 centimetres in depth. These impressions appeared to be evenly spaced, suggesting an object with three long tripod legs had landed with great force. Some bleach marks indicated the object had taken off at a 45 degree angle. Mr O'Neill had never seen anything like this before and had no idea what could have caused such strange damage. He thought it was a prankster, but there were no signs of any tracks. Unlike typical crop circles, this one has been caused by something heavy, destroying the manuka and leaving deep triangular marks in the ground. Well, and that's something. Tell you what, I'd be looking on the trade and exchange or whatever they had back then, because I'd be selling my house, man. I'd be leaving. A few nights later, O'Neill had a group of friends over for dinner. He told them what he had seen in the patch of Manuka. They were shocked. The conversation soon turned to the UFO sighting in Wellington a few nights earlier. One guest joked that the two events might be linked, suggesting that aliens were retaliating for us for landing on the moon a few months earlier. Had they landed their spacecraft at the spot on the farm? Had the craft's legs caused the deep, unusual grooves in the earth? Was the damage caused by the spacecraft taken off again? The mystery deepened as more questions arose. 
The next day, one of the dinner guests phoned Harvey Cook, president of the Tauranga Scientific Space Research Group. Cook gathered a group of colleagues and headed to the farm immediately. The group were in awe at what they were saying. The precision of the triangles, their equidistant placement within the circle, suggested something more than just a random act of nature. We sent soil and plant samples to laboratories, consulted with experts in various fields, and meticulously documented our findings. Kingsley Field, a New Zealand author and former junior reporter at the Thames Star newspaper, was among the first to investigate the Natia crop circle. As a reporter, I often stumbled upon intriguing stories. When I overheard co-workers discussing a mysterious crop circle, I knew I had to see it for myself. Drawn by the strange reports from Natia, Field aimed to uncover the truth behind the crop circle mystery. I headed out there and saw these peculiar circles. It was a strange looking formation and not easily explainable. Could this be an elaborate hoax, a prank designed to deceive the public and media? Or is there something more, something that challenges our conventional understanding? Armed with a curiosity and a keen eye for detail, Field began his investigation. I had absolutely no idea what caused it. The thing I do recall quite clearly was the three triangular footmarks. They would have been the size of a bread and butter plate and were embedded quite deeply in the ground, sort of sloping. Field analyzed and collected all data, ensuring objectivity and accuracy. Each of them had a cross in the center and a hole in the middle. I meticulously recorded all observations and findings, ensuring no detail was overlooked. The Auckland University Research Group carried out an extensive study on the samples and published their findings. The tea tree in the 56-foot circle was dead and still standing. It was dry and white in colour. The burn was uniform down the stem and was obviously not a heat burn. It did not appear to be the work of any weed killer or any normal defoliant. The burns were reminiscent of radiation burns. After the results, Harvey Cook was convinced he collected enough samples to take things even further. He contacted the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research, DSIR, but strangely, they were not interested. The DSR seemed more concerned with practical matters of agriculture and industry, showing little interest in what they perceived as fringe science, or worse, tabloid sensationalism. Their dismissive attitude, their insistence on attributing the Nigatia Circle to mundane causes without proper investigation, struck me as both arrogant and irresponsible. I knew that extraordinary claims required extraordinary evidence, but scientific curiosity should not be stifled by bureaucratic inertia or fear of ridicule. He then took his samples to respected Tauranga horticulturalist John Stuart Menzies. Initially, he suspected the damage might be attributed to spray drift, a common occurrence in agricultural areas. However, upon closer inspection, he too was puzzled. He then decided to use a Geiger counter over the Manuka. This showed signs of increased shortwave radiation. To our astonishment, the Geiger counter registered higher than normal levels of shortwave radiation, particularly in the thicker parts of the wood. Could this be the missing link? The piece of evidence that elevated the Ngatia case from a curious oddity to a scientifically significant event? On October 6th, Stuart Menzies released his findings to the media, making headlines across the country. He revealed that some sort of short-wave, high-frequency radiation had cooked the material from the inside outwards. The effects appear to be instantaneous, reducing the pith to black carbon without the outside showing any signs of burning. Stuart Menzies stated, I know no earthly source of energy which could have produced these effects. A meteorite or lightning strike wouldn't have done this, and it has been too sudden for combustion. Some outside object appears to have landed on the spot and taking off emitted the energy which had cooked the plants. The release of Stuart Menzies' research caused a massive media frenzy which led to questions being asked of the DSIR and why they weren't taking the matters more seriously. In the days following the discovery of the Natia crop circle, the New Zealand government maintained an airy silence. While the media buzzed with speculation and the public demanded answers, official channels remained strangely quiet neither confirming nor denying the strange events in the small rural town. The silence, whether strategic or due to bureaucratic inertia, only deepened the mystery surrounding the Natea crop circle. The government seemed content to observe from afar, perhaps hoping that the public interest in the flattened manuka would fade away. 
Some saw the silence as a tact acknowledgement of something extraordinary, something beyond the government's ability to explain or control. Others, more cynically, viewed the evidence as a cover-up, a deliberate attempt to suppress information that might challenge the established order. Whatever the reason for the government's initial silence, it would not last forever. The entire crop circle, like the intricate patterns etched into the earth, demanded attention, refusing to be ignored. The pressure to respond, to offer some explanation for the inexplicable, continued to mount, driven by a relentless media and a public hungry for answers. Brian Tallboys authorised the DSI to send a plant pathologist to Natea, accompanied by a trio of scientists from Victoria University who specialised in botany, zoology and geology, all tasked with taking samples to analyse. Their arrival, more than a month later, was met with chaos. The crop circle had been trampled and the ground was littered with debris. The DSIR released their findings, attributing the crop circle to fungal attack and root rot. Root rot? Root rot? Are you kidding me? Torbos made a statement to the public. The symptoms found were consistent with death from fungus attack. The manuka surrounding the area was stag-headed, quite typical of plants being attacked by fungus. The manuka is undoubtedly affected by root rot complex or organisms and there are other pathogens present, including manuka blight. The dark colour of the interior of the dead stems is due to a normal separatic fungus which is living on the dead tissue. No radioactivity above the normal background was detected in the peat or the manuka samples from within the outside of the circle. It is apparent that there is nothing abnormal about this dead patch of manuka. It is common for patches of plants to die from any one number of normal causes and these should not be considered the first before worrying about possible extraterrestrial phenomena. End of story. Nothing to see here, folks. Move along. Tall boys refused to make any comment on the triangular marks and then refused to make any comment or speculation further. This fueled conspiracy theories which led to many writing into the newspaper to offer their own theory. Reg Chibnall, host of a television gardening show, explained that saprophytic fungus might have been present in the manuka, but was a secondary state following the tree's death. He pointed out that the university's report never mentioned how the plants died. Chibnall also mentioned conflicting reports on the soil samples taken within the circle. The DSIR insisted that no abnormalities were found in the soil. Chibnall explained that he had planted seeds from the same packet in two samples of soil, one taken from within the circle and one from outside it. The seeds started to sprout in the affected dirt, but then withered and died quickly, whereas the other sample flourished. Dr. Ted Bollard, DSIR Deputy Director of the Plant Disease Division, responded that although saprophytic fungi were found on the manuka, they were not given as the cause of death. The alternative cause of death was root rot, parasitic fungi and or blight, both found on the samples analysed. Dr Bollard then refused to conduct analysis on the Tequiti phenomenon or any other future crop circles found. For the DSIR, this was case closed. After extensive bullshit, the DSIR finally shared its conclusions with the public. The findings left many disappointed as they did not provide a clear resolution to the Natea crop circle enigma. Instead of settling the matter, the DSIR's report intensified the ongoing debate. The scientists suggested it was probably a natural occurrence, but failed to pinpoint an exact cause. They proposed unusual wind patterns or small tornadoes as possible explanations. The dead trees were deemed unrelated to the formation of the crop circle. It was speculated that the trees had been weakened by electric strikes or disease. The public's reaction on the report was mixed, with many remaining unsatisfied. The community of Nata remained divided on the origins of the circle. Reports carried on after, with local residents seeing strange objects in the sky in the weeks leading to the discovery. One Paidoa local reported nearly crashing after a UFO began following him home. Other locals reported seeing three large orange lights over fields in Nataea at different times during the early 1970s. But for the community, those three months of national intense interest still provoke memories and beg the question, was it real? Right folks, so this is the part of the video when we break down all the evidence and I give you my thoughts and opinions what I think it happened. So let's talk about 
to the excuses that the DSI gave us. So, originally they didn't want to be part of this investigation and it took numerous attempts from other scientists until the community pushback was just so extreme that they had to give in. They arrived there a month later and by then the whole crop circle had been completely ruined. That's what they used for the investigation. The only other samples they used was what they obtained from Cook and even that was over a month old. So any radiation signs would have been short lived. Initially it was speculated that the cause of the disease was weed kill. The next excuse they gave us was that it was manuka blight or a fungus. After public opinion called into question that, they changed it to root rot. So what is it? Was it fungus? Was it root rot? Make up your mind guys. As for Farmer Bird, I don't think he made up the story. And I don't think it's fair for everyone to make out that he was just an ignorant farmer. So what are my final thoughts? I think that I'll remain sceptical on this matter. Do I think there's something strange happening in the sky over Wellington that two pilots witnessed? 100%. 100%. Do I think it was the same spacecraft that left the crop circle in Nartia? Because it was a different one.